All right. Hi there. Uh, our recording has already begun and we have some participants here in the chat, so we get to do it live, as they say. <laughs> Um, so I am Lisa Schmidt. I am a senior associate here at Speaker Law. Welcome everyone to this next webinar in our series. Uh, today's topic is gender identity, when and how to address pronouns in court. Uh, and I have with me today for, I believe, the first time, uh, Rick Roan from Warner, Norcross and Judd. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Glad to be here today. Uh, Rick, do you want to give us a little bit of your credentials about why it is that we chose you to come and speak with me about this topic? Um, sure, I will. Well, um, I've been representing uh, parties in uh, the LGBT community throughout my 37 years of practice. And in the earlier years before uh, U.S. versus Windsor in 2013 and Obergefell in 2015, when same-sex couples would break up in their relationships or have uh, custody disputes, uh, and there was no structure of marriage, uh, there was really no recourse. And whoever had more money had more power. Whoever had a biological connection to uh, their children had more uh, legal rights and others had less. And things have certainly changed um, in the dozen or so years since these uh, landmark U.S. Supreme Court cases. And going back to 2012, when I started um, uh, actively working at larger than uh, just in West Michigan on these cases, I became, uh, I guess, what's known as an unintended activist, uh, working for marriage equality and the rights that uh, have followed those two U.S. Supreme Court cases in 2013 and 2015 to help members of the LGBT community have access to uh, legal rights and justice. That's why I'm here. Yeah, uh, and Lisa asked me to uh, take over for her on this webinar for a very similar reason. While you were an unintended activist, I was an intended activist. I am a former board member of the ACLU of Michigan. I've been representing LGBT families also since prior to U.S. versus Windsor. And when the Obergefell decision came out, I read it as quickly as possible and then ran to my local out center to celebrate with my friends. Um, so yes, we are here today to talk about uh, the issue of gender identity in court. And uh, it turns out it's a very timely uh, webinar because tomorrow is World Coming Out Day. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll discuss the process of coming out to the court here. Right. Um, so our first topic is what does gender identity have to do with family law? Are we just being woke here or is it something that's really meaningful? Um, and because Rick and I are far more used to these terms than maybe many of you are. Uh, we'd like to start with a few definitions just so that we're all on the same page. Rick, you had a good, uh, a good resource for this, right? Yes, a resource that I've got is this book by Diane Aronsoff. Uh, it's called Gender Explained. This is the most recent book uh, from the psychologist um, who talks about uh, gender identity issues. And there's a very helpful glossary in the book there are also glossaries available in the State Bar of Michigan family, uh, LGBTQ section. Uh, their webpage has a glossary of terms that are relevant. The American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers on their webpage uh, has a glossary available. And these glossaries are a work in progress because these names and these labels and appropriate language, respectful language is something that's evolving as the LGBT community uh, finds their way uh, forward uh, and as they embrace additional legal rights that they have. And so, uh, for example, a label or a term that's acceptable today uh, was an epitaph uh, in the 60s and 70s when I was uh, growing in, in elementary and junior high and high school, uh, the word queer. Queer is acceptable among LGBT youth and it sounds like a slap in the face to me the first time I heard it a half a dozen years ago. And now it's a word that I accept without feeling like I've been slapped in the face, but it's not a word that I use. I'm not comfortable with it. So that's just an example of how labels and language change over time and, by, and generation by generation, even a couple of generations apart. Uh, so we specifically wanted to talk about, I think, four terms here, uh, transgender, dead name, gender identity, and non-binary. So um, 
as Rick is pulling up those definitions, trans, uh, transgender and the related terms of transsexual, trans, and the slur tranny um, are all what you're going to hear about where we were talking about the evolution of language. Uh, and so, Rick, I'll let you read our definition and then we'll talk about it. Thank that. you, Lisa. Transgender is defined in Aaron Soft's book as a person whose gender identity does not match their sex designated at birth. So when we're born, assuming that we're born in the hospital, a doctor or a nurse assists with the birth. And one of the first announcements, if there hasn't been a gender reveal party earlier during gestation is it's a boy, it's a girl. That's binary, you're one or the other. Uh, you're not something else, at least announced or someone else announced at the time of birth. And from the moment of birth, we're labeled and we're, and the whole time we're growing up, typically, you know, I was always told I'm a boy, I identify as a boy. My sister is a girl, identified as a girl and so on. So a person whose gender identity does not match their sex designated at birth, it's a boy or it's a girl. That's a person who's transgender. Uh, tranny is an epitaph. That's a derogatory, derisive word to used to identify someone who's transgender. Transsexual is a synonym of transgender, meaning the same thing. Going to a couple of the other um, uh, definitions that we have, non-binary, a non-binary person is defined a variety of gender identities that does not exclusively fit into girl slash woman or boy slash man. For example, a person might ad identify as both a girl and a boy, or as neither a girl nor a boy. For someone who's not non-binary, that may be a hard concept to grasp because maybe the person trying to grasp it only identifies as a boy or a man, or as a girl or a woman, but not both. So the question becomes, how can someone be both? So and the answer must be, that's that person's identity. That's how they feel. So when talking about this issue with people um, that don't necessarily understand the non-binary circumstance, I talk about things that are more common to our experience. If you were a girl growing up, you might have known someone or you might have been a tomboy, quote unquote. Um, a person who identifies as non-binary may have those kinds of techniques or those kinds of uh, behaviors and find it part of their identity, not just that they're an atypical woman, but they're not really a woman. Um, same is true on the masculine side of things. If, if a younger boy is more effeminate, they might take that into their identity and realize that they are not fully male, they are something else. But an effeminate boy or young man may not identify as female. Absolutely That true. person may just identify as um, a rather effeminate male person. And it so is it, a it's, highly... It, it's a wide, wide spectrum. It a is a very, a very complicated spectrum. It's why the rainbow is so appropriate, because if you really look at a rainbow, there's no distinct line between yellow and orange, and we still figure out which one it is. Right. Um, and I wanted to go back to something on uh, transgender. Uh, you're going to probably hear terms like trans masculine or trans man and trans feminine or trans femme or trans woman. Um, that always refers to the gender that they express or prefer. You are referencing the person based on the gender they are going to. So a trans masculine person is someone who was identified female at birth and then came out as masculine. A trans feminine person is someone who was identified masculine at birth and then transitioned to feminine. Um, it can get a little confusing because we've got both genders in both definitions. So I wanted to be clear that we were talking what we were talking about there. And so another definition was a dead name. If a boy is named John at birth and that boy um, identifies as female or as a girl, that boy or that young man may become a trans female or trans woman. And John, given name at birth, might adopt the name Jane, uh, which is a feminine name. John's adopted name or embrace name, John's identity name 
is Jane. Her dead name, and I pron I, I, I did not mispronoun <laughs> mispronoun this individual in my example. Uh, the dead name is John. That's the name that a trans person is born with. And we now, should note that this dead name is more of a slang term. It's more of a casual term, um, but it is something that you will hear if you are engaging in conversations with uh, members of this community. And dead name, it's also a verb, dead naming. When you've been dead named, you, someone who may know that you're transgender um, purposely calls you by your dead name. And this plays in a few moments into our court role that we're going to talk about. Um, dead naming can be a way to shame someone or a way to deny their identity, which can be very, very hurtful. That could happen in a family situation. It could happen in a business or an employment situation. It could certainly happen in, in, in the context of court. Um, and in the transgender individuals that I've talked to and worked with, some of them accept, they don't like, but accept the fact that they may be dead named from time to time. Um, and uh, I often ask my transgender clients, how does that make you feel? because I want to have a better understanding so I can be more sensitive and respectful to my transgender clients. And how does that make them feel? Sometimes the answer is it hurts. But I also recognize, the transgender person may tell me, I also recognize that this is a path. It's a journey. And I just want to keep making progress. So we're now I want to transition us um, to why we're talking about this in the family law context. Uh, we all are aware that uh, LGBT people are in the community, uh, but what we may not realize is that they are coming through our doors increasingly uh, as family lawyers. Uh, there is an increased prevalence of non-binary and gender fluid people. Gender fluid meaning people who fall somewhere on that spectrum of the non-binary scale. Um, and this is especially true in the younger generations, Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Gen Z are those coming to majority, coming to the age of majority now, so your teenagers and early 20s, and Gen Alpha are going to be your younger children uh, in these cases. And according to a Pew Research study from 2022, 1.6% of U.S. adults identify as trans or non-binary, but 5.1% of adults under 30 identify in that category. So we see that that uh, trend upwards among the younger generations. Um, and Lisa, where does, where does that come from? Is it a matter of there being more trans or non-binary people, or is it a matter of awareness and acceptance? I, I believe it is more the latter. I believe it is more that we are actively having these conversations and that children are, are being welcomed to explore their gender identity and expression in ways that our generations maybe were not. Um, I know I can say from personal anecdotal experience, I had never even considered whether I was or was not non-binary until I was fully adult and already licensed. So, <laughs> And so it's not only um, our clients as family law attorneys, our clients who are coming to us where one of the uh, parties may or both might be a transgender or non-binary. We may have cisgender parents, meaning their um, gender identity uh, matches their sex assigned at birth. Um, and so you may have a heterosexual couple, a male and a female, and they don't have, they amongst themselves aren't either uh, uh, non-binary or transgender, but they may have a transgender child or think they have a transgender child, or they may have a child who's expressing uh, language and ideas along the, uh, along the notion of non-binary or transgender. And those parents uh, uh, often end up in family conflict and perhaps there's a, a divorce pending or a custody battle. And that's sometimes where you're going to see this issue come. It's not only in the parties uh, of a divorce case, but possibly in their children or including their children. You could have a trans parent and you can have a transgender or non-binary child. And, and those are some of the cases that Lisa and I have experienced. And we can talk about those specific cases as well. Sure. And I will say that there is science that says that uh, being transgender is also a biological and there is a genetic aspect to it as well. So it is a very complicated nature nurture situation. Um, I did also want to mention that uh, in regard to children in particular, 
uh, the Journal of Pediatrics has reported that the number of pediatric transgender clinic patients increased five times in three years. So this is something that we are definitely seeing a dramatic increase. And that means by extension, we're going to see a dramatic increase in the number of cases that come in. Uh, and if we did, if you are interested in those studies, uh, I believe that we have links for those that can be dropped into the chat as well. I want to put it out there right up front when we're talking about children and gender gender clinics, and we're going to talk about some of the treatment options that are available um, for children. Surgery is not being performed on kids. Period. It is. Um, uh, false information that's fomented. We hear about it a lot in the political cycle, but it's being fomented by haters. It is simply not happening, not in the United States. It's against the ethical rules of the American Pediatrics Association and other organizations which physicians and surgeons uh, are part of. And so I'll say it now, or I have to say it again, uh, and and um, you can certainly back back it up uh, by citations, but that is a, a bit of misinformation that's used uh, by a lot of people to try to suppress uh, LGBTQ rights and progress. All right. So, um, Rick, you already touched on this a little bit. Uh, we now want to transition to talking about how we as attorneys can be sensitive to our trans clients and their trans children. Um, and uh, Rick talked about how when people's dead names come up, there's the question of what, how does that make you feel and what steps can we take? Uh, so I, will, I just want to say this very clearly. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone accidentally misgenders people who are trans. Um, it happens, and there's no shame in the fact that it happens. What you can do as an attorney is to be respectful about how you address that. Uh, so, Rick, what do you do when you slip up and use the wrong pronoun or when you hear another attorney having the same statement? I'll even go er earlier to that when I have the first contact with a transgender client or uh, involving a transgender child. I start by asking respectful questions. How would you like, what, what is your preferred pronoun? How would you like to be referred to? I ask this amongst my LGBTQ clients. I ask this amongst uh, my clients who are members of perhaps Native American, Indigenous, First Nations, or Indian uh, background, um, just by way of example. It's a matter of respect. How does someone identify themselves and how do they wanna be referred to? And then I'll put that into my into my notes and I'll put it into my thinking and I will practice making sure that I don't misgender my client. For example, a recent transgender female client of mine going through a custody uh, battle uh, first presented in my office in male attire. Um, looked like a dude, blue jeans, flannel shirt, short hair, whiskers, and during her transition over about a six month period as she was transitioning, as she uh, had uh, access to hormone therapy, and as she became more comfortable in her uh, identity, she transitioned in the way that she dressed when she would come to my office. And so it was harder, it was easier to avoid misgendering when she looked female, had longer hair, wore makeup, had a handbag um, and wore dresses. Um, than when she looked like a dude. And so, but you've got to forgive yourself if you make a mistake and you have to work very, very uh, intentionally to be respectful. And so it's okay to ask early on, how would you like to me to refer to you? Or if it's their child, how do you want me to refer to your child? How does your child refer to his, him or her or their self? And one thing that I would recommend is that you make this a habit for every case, like Rick said, um, because you can't tell, you can't see trans on a person's face, right? Like you don't know what the person's identity is based on the way they walk into your office. Um, and so I, when I was working as a, as a solo, but, or when I was an, a partner of my own firm, I should say, I, prior to joining Speaker Law, it was right in my intake form. Every single client said, fill out your name and what are your pronouns? 
because that way I didn't make any assumptions. Um, it was just part of the normal course. Now, what I would, oh, go ahead. And we're seeing pronouns uh, listed on, on people's signature block, on letterheads, in business, in law, through the courts. I personally have not put mine on, but we have a policy at my firm through our DEI committee and through our Pride at Warner, our LGBTQ committee at Warner, Norcross and Judd, where we were able to put our preferred pronouns uh, onto our uh, signature block. I think it's probably about time that I do it uh, since I was one of the founders of these organizations at my <laughs> firm. Um, and I think it might just be laziness on my part. So I'll stop being lazy and be more respectful. My preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I guess I'm a cisgender gay guy. I'm openly gay. Uh, I was born male. I identify myself as male. I'm proud to be a male. I like being a male. So uh, um, those are my pronouns and I better put them on my signature block. Sure. Um, I will say my preferred pronouns are uh, she, her, but the situation is complicated and not public. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, so to what happens if- And I'm you glad you said that, Lisa, because as I interrupt you, this is a very personal choice. And 37 years into my practice, I can easily say in this public forum that I'm an out gay man. I wasn't 37 years ago. I was scared to death. But again, a person's identity is their personal choice. And the best thing that you can do is to be respectful of that person's choice and not impose your choice or your ideals on other people. Sure. Thank you. Um, so what happens if we screw up? What happens if we have somebody that we understand to be a trans masculine person and we say she? Apologize. If you're, if you're speaking to the person face to face, you apologize, correct yourself and move on. And it may be something that you do repeatedly. Uh, if I have an hour, an hour and a half uh, conversation or, or a meeting with a client as I'm preparing for um, a court or a court proceeding or as I'm working on a pleading or a document to be filed in the court, I'm likely going to misgender the person quite a few times in spite of my best efforts. I've had a lot of practice at this and I still make mistakes. It slips out because it's part of our normal human conversation. So I apologize, correct myself and move on. And yes, and that is my standard practice too. The big thing is to not make a big deal about it um, because you may be ashamed about the fact that you screwed up, but that doesn't mean that your client needs to make you feel better for your mistake. Right. Sorry, I meant she, move on. Um, but what about, now we're going to transition into the more formal space, uh, what about in court? How can we make the courts use the proper names and honorifics and pronouns for our clients? One of the takeaways and one of the purposes of this education program today is the new court rule that we have effective this past spring, Michigan Court Rule 1.109, capital D, 1, small Six IV. Uh, B. I'm sorry. That is uh, D one B, as in boy. D one B, and what D one B says is parties and attorneys may also include Ms., Mister, or Mix M X as a preferred form of address and and one of the following personal pronouns in the name section of the caption: He him his, she her hers or they, them, theirs. Courts must use, it's mandatory, the individual's name, the designated salutation, maybe doctor, or personal pronouns or other respectful means that are not inconsistent with the individual's designated salutation or personal pronouns. When addressing, referring to, or identifying the party or attorney, either orally or in writing. This means that on the case caption, a transgender a uh, female attorney would use uh, on, on her identification, uh, attorney for plaintiff would use her preferred pronouns, her name and her salutation. Or if the client, let's say that it's a, uh, the plaintiff is transgender, that you would use in the pleading that person's name. That puts the court on notice as to the party's names or the attorneys and their pronoun. 
in the course of the court proceeding when the attorneys either side are referring to the parties or when the court is referring to the parties, the court and the attorneys must use that person's pronoun. It would be improper and it would be a violation of the court rule for the court or for opposing counsel or, or for the attorney's counsel uh, to misgender someone. But this happens. And so Lisa's question is, what happens if there's a misgendering? Sure. I, think um, the I, most did, I did want to interrupt, sorry, uh, and point out that, Rick, when we were preparing for this, we didn't catch the detail that the court must use the individual's name, salutation, and pronouns. That means that you can request that the court use the person's preferred name rather than the dead name. Now, we Correct. do have some counties that continue to use the original caption. If you're dealing with, for example, a post-judgment modification of parenting time, your judgment or your caption may still say the party's married names and then now known as. I would encourage you to use that now known as to include the person's preferred name. Um, and then I also have taken to on every caption, same as it was in every client intake on every caption, I include the pronouns. And that way the court has both the name and the pronouns right there in front of it uh, as every time it calls the case. And an interesting uh, part of this court rule is what is excluded. Let's say that you've got a case and the issue is a custody dispute or custody and parenting time and the parents are cisgender divorced, it's post-judgment, and that one of their children uh, is transgender or non-binary or identifies as such. The court rule does not require the parties or the court to refer to, the, to a child of the parties by their preferred pronoun. And so that's a distinction that, that I think is important here. We shouldn't assume that that's required. It doesn't prevent an attorney from drawing, drafting a pleading using their client's child's preferred pronoun or preferred name or not using their dead name. That might cause some conflict within uh, the court proceedings if one of the parents doesn't recognize the child's transgender identity and the other parent does recognize it and does support it, which is typically the kinds of conflicts that we have when there are children uh, uh, in this category. And we're definitely going to talk more about this case in the future, but that's exactly the case that happened in, or that's exactly the situation that happened in my case, uh, Riley versus Graves. As I was reviewing the transcript, it got quite confusing because one parent is referring to the child by their chosen name and the other parent is referring to the child by uh, their birth name. Uh, and eventually the court had to make a decision because the court had to issue an opinion. Uh, Fortunately for us, even though the court got the issue wrong and we did end up with an appeal, the judge was able to interview the child. The child was of sufficient age and did use the child's preferred name in the opinion. Oh, okay. I did not see that we have a hand raised. I don't know where I would have seen that. Uh, so what is your question, Liz? I'm not sure how to. Can you throw it into the questions and answers, the Q&A? She said it was a mistake. Oh, well, so, never mind. <laughs> so um, going back to the court rule, um, one thing that we wanted to talk about uh, was, and we talked about misgendering, uh, what happens uh, and how we deal with that. What happens if the court, if the judge misgenders your client? Sure. Um, so if the judge, let's say the judge calls the case incorrectly, calls the case of Mr. Jones versus Mrs. Jones, and Mrs. Jones is now Mr. Smith. Um, I would recommend that you first say, Your Honor, I am appearing on behalf of Mr. Smith. Um, his preferred name and pronouns are, you know, John Smith, he, him. Uh, and we would request that those honorifics and pronouns be used according to MCR 1.109 D1B. I would say yeah, that. And as long as you start with that and you don't interrupt the judge or you don't interrupt the other attorney or you don't interrupt someone in the middle of their of their of their speaking, then you're showing respect, but you're also uh, seeking enforcement of the court rule. Now, a judge or uh, opposing party may accidentally misgender. 
You request the correction politely and without interrupting the first time. You may have to request it a second time. I would hope that you wouldn't have to request it a third time or more during a proceeding. However, about 20 years ago, in a custody case that I handled, for my first transgender client, it was a post-judgment matter. I was in a small rural community um, with one judge who was very conservative, not that every small rural community has conservative judges, but this judge was, and my client was transgender, had fully transitioned, and although my client was the mother of the child of the twelve-year-old child in, in in dispute in the custody case. My client presented like a dude that he was. He was transgender male, um, the mother of this child, and he appeared in court with a full beard, dressed like a dude, deeper voice because of the um, medical intervention with his transitioning, and the judge continued to misgender my client throughout the proceedings, and we didn't have this court rule 20 years ago. I first referred to my client, uh, by, and my client used a different name than, than was on the court pleadings, and so I referred to my client by uh, his chosen name and, and gender identity, and the judge ordered me to refer to my client by the caption because there had not been a legal name change of my client. The judge asked me, has your client legally changed his name or her name? And I said, no. And so now a legal name change is not required for the courts to and the, and the attorneys to have to follow rule 1.109B. Absolutely. And this is something that you should be prepared to educate your judges about. Uh, this court rule went into effect in April of this year. I'm certain that there are judges who did not pick up on the fact that it happened. Um, I'm certain there are those of you who did not know that there was a court rule for this. Um, and so be prepared, have that court rule ready for you. Uh, if you get pushback from the judge, well, it's not his legal name, so I'm going to continue to call him by his his legal name. Uh, you can go, go further than that and read the court rule to the court and ask the court to follow that court rule. And then what happens if the court, if the judge continues not to follow the court rule? Let's say the judge... Um, doesn't believe that transgenderism exists or that it's against the judge's firmly held religious convictions, to use some catchphrases that we hear often. Then Certainly. what? Um, so this is where I'm going to put my appellate hat on and I'm going to encourage you to build a good record, right? The first time that this comes up, place it on the record. State State that you are asking for enforcement under that court rule. Read that court rule into the record. Ask the judge if the judge is making a ruling that the child that the person's name will be referred to by their prior name. Consider even filing a motion to enforce the court rule. Again, giving us a paper trail to follow. Once you have all of that, if the judge is continuing to refuse to follow the court rule, you may, in extreme circumstances, need to consider filing a motion for judicial disqualification under MCR 2.003C1. C is in CAT 1. There are two grounds of that court rule that could apply. One is bias or prejudice against the party. And two is the judge, based on objective and reasonable perceptions, has either a serious risk of actual bias impacting the due process rights of a party, as announced in Caperton versus Macy, or has failed to adhere to the appearance of impropriety standard in the canon of judicial ethics. So here we have, in your, the case that Rick has just described, a judge who has on the record said that either they don't believe in um, transgenderism or that it is against their sincerely held religious belief. Well, trans issues are going to be part of this case. The very fact that the, the judge is demonstrating bias by misgendering your client, if these statements have been made on the record, or even if they've been made in chambers and you're able to, to sign an affidavit that the statements have been made, um, that may well be a basis for judicial disqualification. Expect what, is the, Go ahead. what is the most important rule of judicial disqualification? What do you have to keep in mind if you're going to 
uh, make that play. Well, you have to win because if you don't win, you piss off your judge. Yeah. Um, so be prepared, do your work, build a good case, um, and then be prepared to appeal the inevitable denial to your chief judge. Um, note that the judicial disqualification requires an affidavit, so be prepared to put together an affidavit laying out the basis, and then get your hearing scheduled in front of the chief judge to appeal that de that denial of disqualification as soon as you can. Uh, that way you don't have a judge who is ruling on other issues in your case while the request for disqualification is going forward. And here's another consideration. While you're ensuring or seeking to ensure that the court rule is followed, while you're considering seeking disqualification of a judge, make sure that you involve your client in the decision-making process. Your client may say, hey, I don't want to rock this boat. This is my life that we're dealing with here. I don't want to piss off the judge any more than they're pissed off. And so this shouldn't be a decision that you as the counsel for your client make in a vacuum. Make sure that they're on board with you um, because you know it may be a really difficult, difficult road ahead if you and your client decide to pursue enforcement of this order, pursue disqualification, pursue an appeal uh, uh, in, in some fashion. But it shouldn't be something that you just uh, run on your own and proceed on your own without your client's input because your client may not want to fight that fight. Your client may want to uh, save their energy, their effort, their time, and their money for a different fight. And, it's and, that, and, pointing that, out, go ahead. and that's another way to be respectful of your client. And it's worth pointing out that you need to look at it from a practical perspective, too. If your judge is disqualified, then what? Who is the case going to be assigned to next? If you're in a smaller county and you have a, a small number of judges, you can pretty well predict who's going to be assigned next. Is that person going to be more or less receptive to the issues related to LGBT? Um, these are conversations that you should be having with your client before you decide to file that motion for judicial disqualification, uh, because that's definitely a, uh, a practical consideration to be had. So we wanted to talk about some children issues, and you've got the Riley versus Graves case. Are you ready to talk about that? Absolutely. I think we're pretty well on time to transition into that. So as Rick mentioned, our court rule applies only to parties and attorneys. It does not apply to the children in our cases. Um, and this is going to be an issue that comes up. We are already seeing parents disagreeing regarding the treatment of their children's gender identity and also um, the use of that. Oh. I've got a question here uh, from Susan Murphy that says, if it's not in the caption, the rule doesn't apply. I ask because my ADR staff is concerned about knowledge of preferred pronouns, et cetera. So that's a very good question. The court rule is specific about it being in the caption. So in order for, to enforce it, you would need to include it in the caption. Um, however, as ADR staff, you are certainly welcome to address it in a less formal way ask the parties what their preferred pronouns are, ask the parties what their preferred identification and honorifics are. Um, you have more flexibility in the ADR space. Uh, this court rules it specifically re referring to judges and attorneys. Um, Rick, do you have any thoughts about that question? I don't think that we really uh, focused on honorifics much. We've been talk talk talking about gender identity and preferred pronouns, but the honorifics part is Let's say that uh, the, one of the parties is a, a or both of the parties are doctors, uh, either a doctor, a professor, uh, a doctor, a psychologist, a doctor, a surgeon. Um, that's that honorific must be used if it's in the caption. And so uh, it's easy to slip and refer to the opposing uh, party when you're doing an examination in a hearing um, as uh, Ms. Smith instead of Dr. Smith. Um, it can be a ploy that prick lawyers do to needle the other side or to be, disrespect, be disrespectful in kind of a surreptitious way. 
um, re continuing to refer to Dr. Smith as Ms. Smith. When you know that she's a doctor, you know that she's a surgeon and she's the head of the department at, at you know, Ford Hospital. And so that's the honorific part of this uh, court rule. It also applies then to a, a, a person's um, degrees and, and what they've earned. Sure. And that also gets into the the questions regarding the non-binary folks, because this court rule specifically accepts and requires the court to accept that mixed title and also the they, them pronouns. And so a lot of people will struggle with that, particularly how to say it. Um, I know that several different people say it different ways. They'll say it mix or mex. Uh, kind of swallow that vowel and make it mix, and you're more or less correct. Um but if you are choosing because you don't understand that that title or if you have a an English degree like I do and struggle to deal with they them as a singular pronoun, um, yeah. if you are choosing that, you are choosing to disrespect the person who has told you that she and he don't work, that those things don't apply. Um, and so you need to. You need to swallow your your English English degree elitism um, and just go with the preferred pronouns. And the court rule says that that's what we have to do. So, yes, it is appropriate for your legal pleadings to say the person they that is accurate. <laughs> I had a I had a lively conversation with a colleague on that very issue uh, where the colleague was expressing to me his difficulty with a they them theirs. And he said, why is that so difficult? And I said, because in our English language, they, them, theirs is refers to a plural group. It doesn't refer to an individual, but for someone who's non-binary, who does not use he, him, his, or she, she, her, hers pronouns and uses they, them, theirs, that's their choice. We need to respect it. It's very, very difficult. And so you got to get your brain around it. And as Lisa said, you've got to chuck your English degree and, and, be respectful, as as in as improper as the words on paper look, and as improper as the words when spoken sound. All right, let's get back to Riley versus Graves because we've only got about fifteen more minutes. Um, so this is dealing with this case directly dealt with the issue of um, two parents in disagreement over their child's. Uh, gender identity. Uh, unfortunately, this child who was masculine at birth, assigned male at birth, um, had begun expressing uh, feminine traits as a toddler, literally would steal dresses from mom's closet to dress up like a girl at age one and a half. Um, both parents had been at the time concerned about the gender expression in the very early ages, but then these unmarried parents diverged once they started to hear what the doctors had to say. Um, mom heard the doctors say that, you know, this early, it might not, it might just be experimental, it might just be exploration. And then as the child got older and was more persistent in the expression, the doctors said, yep, this is definitely a situation where we're dealing with a trans child. And so mom started using the preferred name, the preferred pronouns, and dad did not. When the child was in third grade, uh, she came out to her teacher without either parent getting a say in the matter. Um, and so, and that is going to happen, by the way. Uh, the children are going to talk to the other adults in their lives rather than their parents. Um, and so then the parents were put in a situation where they had to decide what to do. Mom decided she was going to be fully supportive started working with the doctor to see about a referral to a treatment professional. Uh, yes, uh, my, my very handy person pointed out, I represented mother in this appeal, um, and I should have said that. Um, mom was working with the, the doctors to try and get appropriate referrals. Dad was uh, continuing to refer to the child by the masculine identities, was mandating that the, the child have haircuts whenever their hair, her hair got too long, um, and was also um, highly encouraging, if not forcing the child to participate in masculine activities in his home, including car repair and things like that. So the case comes to a head because the child starts to have um, 
some severe mental health issues, starts to have suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation every time the child needs to go over to dad's house. Dad eventually agreed to have the child referred to by the female pronouns in school, but that was only on the agreement by this third grader that she would be called he in dad's home. So mom files a motion for sole legal custody and in the alternative to resolve the question of whether the child would be permitted to receive hormone blocker treatment. Now we talked earlier about how surgery is not done on children. Uh, the current be medical best practice is that children prior to the age of puberty, um, if they have a clear expression of uh, transgender gender identity, they can receive hormone blockers that postpone puberty in order to be certain that that is the route that they are going to take. And then should they choose to pursue that, they can, per they can receive hormone replacement therapy in order to ensure that the puberty they experience is in line with their uh, internal gender. Uh, so we had a circumstance where because the child was in third grade, we had a prepubescent child. Uh, and so mom was trying to seek uh, hormone suppression and dad was not in agreement. So we- and as, a, as a little more information on that, when the parent is seeking that medical advice and that medical intervention, uh, uh, in some communities, there's a gender clinic as there is in Grand Rapids at uh, Helen DeVos Children's Hospital. And it's a combination of, of professionals, a pediatrician, a therapist, an endocrinologist. It's a team that work together to examine, interview uh, the child and help the child and the parent or the parents make the informed decision of what route to go. It's not just the pediatrician decides or therapist decides, uh, or, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a combination. It's, it's a lot of people having a lot of input into this very, very important decision. Absolutely. And so in this case, mom was going through those steps. We did have a referral to an endocrinologist and dad didn't want the child to go to the endocrinologist. So exactly what you said, we were going through that process. Uh, I did not represent her at the trial court level. I got involved at the, the appellate level. Um, and so, as I said, in this case, dad represented himself. And I think that that worked in my client's favor because her experts went mostly unchallenged. Um, and she was able to very clearly make the medical case for how dad's behaviors were directly causing or contributing to the child's uh, gender dysphoria. I just used another term. Gender dysphoria is the medical diagnosis, the mental health diagnosis that says that the person's outward gender and internal gender identity are in conflict to the point that it's causing distress. It can cause many different forms of distress. It can be anxiety, depression, just suicidal ideation, all of these things. But it, the gender dysphoria is a medical diagnosis. It is not the same thing as transgenderism, which is not medical. So in this case, we had the trial. Dad represented himself. Um, mom's experts made the case for why it was necessary from a medical perspective. The court asked dad, hearing all these experts, has it changed your mind? And dad said no. What the trial court didn't do was make the decision. The trial court denied mom's motion for change of legal custody because it determined that there was not proper cause or change of circumstances since the child's gender expression had been readily apparent since the child was a toddler and declined to resolve the dispute between the parents regarding the medical care basically telling them to try harder to settle. Um, that's where I came in. We filed a motion to appeal, or we filed a, an appeal on that issue and said, at the very minimum, the court should have resolved the case, resolved the question. And in the probably single most definitive response I've gotten, a 2-1 split ruled that the trial court's order was vacated, that the court would immediately enter an order giving mom sole legal custody and ordering dad to only use the preferred pronouns and uh, and identity of the child and the name of the child. Uh, that order was entered very promptly and, uh, and the case proceeded from there. Uh, but so we did have a very good 
uh, response from the Court of Appeals. And if you have a case like this and you have a judge that's resistant to the idea, I do encourage you to take a look at Riley versus Graves because the court did a good good job of reviewing the facts in the case, including the medical facts in the case. Um, and I think we have the site for that as well. So thankfully, with your experience in uh, Riley versus Graves, you were able to get relief in the Court of Appeals, um, uh, which benefited your client's child to get the medical intervention that she needed to stabilize her mental health. Have you kept up with this client or that child to see how the child is doing? Uh, we did. I did follow up with the client uh, recently because I knew I was going to be talking about the case. Um, unfortunately, dad decided that he was going to put his uh, feet in the sand and not change his mind. And after a motion to enforce the order requiring him to use the, the female pronouns um, and a letter from the psychologist further explaining the harm that was being caused by him not, his parenting time has actually been suspended indefinitely. Wow. So at least the child doesn't have anxiety over the prospect of going to spend time at dad's home, being referred to as a male and having to do car repair. Correct. Um, so, and the child is proceeding with both mental health and physical treatment. So fantastic in that regard. So my experience uh, with one of my clients in this similar case was at a little bit of an earlier stage. We didn't go to a hearing. We were able to resolve it at the last minute, but the child was older uh, when we finally got the intervention. I represented um, a mother of a child who was uh, divorced from the father for a dozen years. The child was 14 when the client came to me and she was trying to work out with her former husband an agreement uh, so that the child could be treated with hormone, uh, pu pu puberty blockers to suppress puberty. And at 14, the child was in puberty. And the father would not recognize that the child was a trans, a born male transitioning to female and identified as female. And so this was the parental conflict. She, when she engaged me, she had already been uh, to the um, gender clinic at Helen DeVos Children's Hospital and had worked with the pediatrician, the therapist, and the endocrinologist. And clearly, this child was uh, certain and clear uh, in her identity as female. Um, the father continued to, to fight. I'm sorry, the mother started when the child was 14. By the time the case came to me, the child was nearly 16 and turned 16 years old and was in full puberty. By the time um, I got involved in this case, the, um, the child appeared very masculine, had dark hair, had a hairy beard, uh, long hair, was six feet, four inches tall, and looked like a football player. And her perception was that she was a delicate girl in this body that she abhorred. Since the child couldn't get the puberty blockers, the child had such self-hatred and self-loathing, the child was expressing um, suicidal ideation. The mother was desperate to, to get this resolved. And so um, it took a very long time to get a hearing since the parents had joint legal custody. Mother could not make the decision on her own and the, and the uh, uh, gender clinic would not risk uh, working on the child without, uh, working with the child um, without consent of both parents. And so literally the night before the hearing and this, this child, this child wouldn't bathe because the child hated the look of her body when she would disrobe to shower. And so she wouldn't bathe. And there was there were hygiene problems, all kinds of problems. And so um, on the night before the hearing, um, the father sent a text to me. I don't usually text with clients and certainly not the other side, but the father was, was unrepresented. And he said, I consent to the treatment. The next morning, the mother was at the clinic and the uh, puberty blockers were started. I've not kept in touch with that client um, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, but I'm confident that based on the mother's commitment and based on the recommendations of the medical professionals that, you know, this child was saved. So this is what happens in these cases. These cases are sometimes a matter of life and death. So if a client presents in your office with a transgender child or uh, 
with their own identity or their spouse's identity as transgender, and you don't know what to do, find out some, find someone who does and make a referral. Sure. And that's that's um, how you can be helpful to these cases that are going to come into your door. Absolutely. I wish we could stop there, but we have one question and I because that was a perfect ending moment, but we do have a question from Casey uh, Butch Miller. Uh, what happens if you're on the other side of things? Uh, if you have the client who walks into your office and says that my son is being treated like a daughter by his what his mother, and I refuse to say that I'm going, I'm not going to call my son a girl. What do you do in that case? If the if the client is insisting on you referencing the child by the child's dead name or by the child's non preferred pronouns. I would do I would do some further inquiry, but I would certainly strongly consider whether I would take that case or not. And I most likely, if the client was insistent and I felt there was any credibility to the claim, I would not represent that client. It would be against my 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 principles of life and and my my and my commitment to activism for the LGBTQ community. I just wouldn't do it. You don't sure. have to take every case that comes in your door. Uh, I do think that it is it is every attorney's choice along those lines where they're going to draw the line and i do think that there is a role as counselor in those cases if let's say rather than the client walked in your door with this case what if it was an established client who suddenly had this issue if that were the case for me i would take the time to try to educate the client about the consequences of the choice they were making and say, are you really interested in putting forward this, this perspective when it is very clearly and medically against the best interest of the child? Um, so I would say in that situation, we have to kind of take the role of counselor. And if the client is insisting, let's say that instead of it being the child, if the client is insisting that you refer to their ex-partner by their dead name, I think we go back to the court rule and say, look, client, I'm not allowed to call your ex by their dead name. It's just, it's in the court rule. I'm not allowed to do that. If I did, I would be violating the court rules. So uh, on the screen, you've been seeing a lot of re references or for, for further resources that we've been providing to you. And a couple others uh, would be the AYA Youth Collective, which is a drop-in center serving youths age 14 to 24 in Grand Rapids, focusing on homelessness and instability. It provides a safe place for rest, recharge, and meeting everyday needs in a caring community. This is not a housing situation, but it's a day center where uh, kids can come in and there's mentoring, there's peers, and they do have a housing program that helps youth connect with peers and mentors for safe and affordable housing. This is supported by the Grand Rapids Community Foundation and was started uh, through uh, generous donations to our LGBT fund and others. And then I would also like to refer you to a case review, a law review case note um, by Brian Sarnacki as the son of David Sarnacki, a family law attorney in uh, Grand Rapids. Brian's article was in the Wayne Law Review, 68.2 point, page 423. And it was uh, uh, an article addressing the Meriwether versus Hartop case, a Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, case uh, in 2021. And um, it was addressing the issue of uh, gender pronouns and the balance between, sorry, let me just give you the quote. It was the balance between understanding employees' First Amendment rights and balancing with transgender students' rights. So I would commend that case to you as well for further information. Thank you. All right, we have run out of time. I do see we had one question we didn't get to, which is what to do if the judge says that the, the parents should take the child to the doctor. The answer is yes. The answer is that this is a medical situation as well as an identity situation. And so if this is an issue that the parents can't agree on, do get experts involved do have the children examined to determine, have them screened to see whether they are in fact transgender, if that is an appropriate thing. At the very minimum, that's gonna give your parents more to chew on as far as making the right choice for them. Uh, Rick, thank you so much for coming and sharing your, your knowledge and expertise on this issue. My pleasure, thank you for inviting me.
And thank you, everyone. Um, we are in the market for additional web webinar and white paper topics. If you have an idea of something you would like us to dig into further in the future, please do email us. And uh, we're going to put an email into the chat here in a moment so that you can send us your ideas for a future topic. All right. Thank you very much.